You are the traveler of many worlds. You find Wang Shu in in a state of disarray. The land is barred in black miasma as heli turtles and mighty turtles alike become cloaked in dark energy. You make quick work of it, however, as you always have, with a blade in your hand and the elements to guide you. Yet the further you trek, you realize it was not only enemies tainted with the miasma, but also the patrons of the inn. Civilians are hoarded by the entrance, succumbing to the effects of the great energy as each either lash out in black rage or curl in agony. You ask the lady by the desk what happened. Why is Wang Shu in such a state of peril? The boss lady is pacing around the inn, busy assisting the guests who have fallen ill to the energy. She turns a frantic eye towards you and almost weeps in joy upon seeing you. She tells you that the Abyss Mages started terrorizing the patrons of the inn, but there was one creature she had never seen before walk amongst them with a commanding authority. It bore purple garments and spoke of salvation and peace despite the cackles of lightning dancing around it. The vigilant Yasha engaged in battle to protect the people of the inn. That's when you realize. Where was the vigilant Yasha? You ask Virgil dead if she has seen Zhao. But she only shakes her head and tells you that she has not seen him for several days, and that in his absence, the dark energy only grew. You and Paimon share a knowing look. There is a heavy weight in your chest. You assure Ver that you will find Zhao, and that you will assist him in stopping the abyss. She can only nod. You make your way to Dihua Marsh, and further and further into the ruins, you smell it in the air. Blood and battle. The faint remnants of animal energy are strong, forming a coherent path that led you into the ruins. But you also detect something else. The concentration of abyssal magic. Purple and black cloud your vision, and the walls become tainted in abyssal ruins and scriptures far beyond your own comprehension. You press on, sword tighter in your grip. You see the chamber where the abyssal magic coagulates, and a towering figure stands proud in the center of the room. The Abyss Lector. Balls of lightning hover around the Evangelist, the book in its hands hovering a space above it as the room fills with abyssal energy. Grace be upon you. Then a scream. You engage in combat, blade in hand as you strike. The Lector is keen, however, and you are met with several flashes of violet lightning. The battle between you is a cathartic tango. You take one step forward and the lecture blinks out of existence. One ball of lightning towards you and you take a step back. You both fall into rhythm. But in the heat of the battle, you feel to sense it. The sudden splurge of animal energy is too rapid for you to react. You fall as a weight is pressed on you. And a harsh girl rings across the chamber. A spear digs into your side. You call out the name. But no response. The intricacies of abyss corruption still remain a mystery to us this day. Even with everything we know, Genshin Impact's lore barely scratches the surface of what abyssal magic really is, and how the previous beings of Conria were able to use elemental magic despite not receiving favor from the gods. But the Corruption Trilogy was always meant to be a thought experiment of not only potential characters, but also what we know from how past corruptions were done by both the Fatui and the Abyss. Today, however, will be a much more different tone. Because for the whole trilogy, there is only one fact for sure we know from the story. The weaponization of the Divine and the use of Archon magic against Celestia themselves is the key antagonistic motif. And with that, why don't we look at a very deity that regards himself as nothing but a weapon? Welcome to the final video of the Corruption Trilogy, a series of videos discussing the past, present, and future of how Genjin Impact's main antagonistic themes revolve around retribution against the Divine by corrupting and weaponizing the very deities that walk on this earth. Today, we will be discussing the corruption of the Vigilant Yaksha why the abyss should target him, and what would happen if he were to be corrupted. Again, 
This video will not be covering in-game lore, but rather a hypothesis and thought experiment for the future. Please keep that in mind when watching the video. So, let's begin. The Vigilant Yaksha is the last of the five Yakshas of Rex Lapis who are tasked with vanquishing the remnants of the old god's hatred over the course of the Archon War. However, one by one, they succumb to the very karmic death and insanity brought upon by their responsibilities. One disease, two turned against each other, and one missing, leaving only the Conqueror of Demons as the sole survivor. But Zhao's existence is one of constant subjugation, a never-ending battle with his own burdens that he cannot share with anyone, an eternal dance of suffering that is bound to reach its final verse. Zhao himself cares for mortal life and takes his responsibilities as a protector of Liyueth to the ends of the earth. He cares not for gratitude or repayment for his intentions of keeping Rex Lapis's people safe through arduous combat. However, we know that though his intentions are for the betterment of others, and that he is a compassionate entity despite his disposition, that would not stop the reality that he will eventually break. And corruption through abyssal magic would only hasten his ruin. We know two instances of corruption by the abyss in game, Devalin and Andreas. In both moments, we are able to see just how the abyss carry their duties. First and foremost, there is a physical means of wearing the target down. Nivalin was physically sick from the poison he consumed from Durin which floats abyssal magic through him, and Andreas was being kept down by abyssal chains by the Herald. The subject must be going through physical pain in order for them to be as susceptible as possible to the corruption of the abyss. But we also know that it isn't required, as the main form of corruption they do is through abusing insecurities and doubts that the deities may have personally planting false hopes and seeds of doubt into the deity's mind to corrupt them. Devalin's fear of Mondstadt abandoning and fearing him was what was used against him, and Andreas was being coerced for true salvation and power by the Herald. The Abyss, coupled with magic of their own, want to destroy the willpower of the deity they are corrupting by amplifying either repressed desires and wants, as well as doubts and anxieties. However, we know that abyssal magic can corrupt those with strong ambitions and goals, those who are dedicated to their ideals. Ajax and Gold are notable examples of this fact. Therefore, having a strong will is not the same as being resistant to the corruption either. Hence, whatever methods the abyss use to weaponize these deities, it is both physical and mental. So, how would the Vigilant Yaksha's corruption fare? The first requirement would be met with difficulty, but not impossibility, on the part of the Abyss. Unlike the Valen and Andrus, the Conqueror of Demons was never passive. He has always been on duty for millennia and has not missed opportunities in battling the demons. Therefore, physically harming him in battle would not be easy for the Abyss. But that isn't to say he does not have his own weaknesses. We know that Zhao is in a constant state of pain. Though he is more resilient and battle-hardened due to his skills not being dulled by time, his suffering is much greater than the other two deities. This would make him more susceptible to physical poisoning by abyssal magic, similar to the chains at Andreas. It is seen that despite an entity being benevolent and charitable, like Devalin and Durin, abyssal corruption can still seep through. Upon fighting the abyss, the amplification of his karmic suffering would heighten the process of corruption. And we know that him donning the mask does cause him pain, which is one of his signature techniques in battle. He already almost lost once to his karmic debt. It is not impossible to say he will lose again. But abusing his pain is not the only way to slay him in battle. Zhao, despite all his claims, is not exempted from having his own ambitions, regardless of its purity and honor. He is a Yaksha one who is dedicated to the ideals of Rex Lapis and keeping Liyue clean from the darkness of the old gods. Zhao may see himself as a weapon, but there are moments of weaknesses where he does show that he has a desire to be free. Of course, this is blasphemous, and the conqueror of demons would never dream of speaking against his savior's last decree. But it is not to say that perhaps, subconsciously, these desires fester. In his name card, 
We know that Zhao longs for a day to come where he will wear the mask and dance, not to conquer demons, but to the tune of the flute amid a sea of flowers. And it isn't unfair to say that Zhao does have his share of wanting to ease the pain. And while he takes his duties very seriously, Zhao has had his moments where he does want a peaceful and carefree life, despite knowing that he can't have it. Those repressed desires will be the perfect ammunition against him. The Abyss would have the perfect temptation against the conqueror of demons. Join them, and he will finally be rid of the eternal suffering his accumulated karmic debt has brought upon him. They would question him of what Liyue has ever done for him despite his millennia of hardship. What is the use of following the fragile orders of a dead god? What is the use of protecting a land who has believed itself independent from the divine? Would he rather not just rest? But an important question is, why? Why should the Abyss ever consider corrupting the Vigilant Yaksha? The entire tale of the five Yakshas became a testimony of how five divine deities broke because of the weight of their responsibilities. Ridding Liyue of the demons born from the anger of the gods made them the very demons that the people came to fear. So, targeting the Vigilant Yaksha would be much easier because Zhao's mental resilience would have already suffered a heavy burden. Secondly, having a rampaging, war-hungry Yaksha would be a good benefit for the Abyss, especially with the potential amount of havoc that the Conqueror of Demons will bring to Teyvat. Out of all the Adepti, the Yakshas are known for their existence solely being combat-oriented machines. Taking one down wouldn't be easy, so the Abyss would be banking on the chaos Zhao's presence would be bringing. And lastly, which will be the biggest benefit of the Abyss to corrupt the Guardian Yaksha, is that Zhao's karmic debt has the potential to spread to other entities, and even make them go berserk. We have seen the effects of Zhao's karmic debt on other entities in his story quest, and while at first it may seem that the Abyss would have an uncontrollable and volatile form of miasma that could also corrupt them, integrating Zhao's karmic debt into their own abyssal corruption could increase the potential for corrupting more deities, especially ones that are not mentally resilient. Having Zhao release all of his karmic debt would bear unthinkable and perhaps irreversible effects on the mortals that would fall under the weight of the miasma, and God only knows what thousand years of uninhibited grief, sorrow, and suffering could do. But the corruption of the vigilant Yaksha is only a thought experiment. A potential plotline should the Abyss continue their plan of weaponizing deities across Teyvat. In all honesty, a plotline is only significant if it could fit and tie in together old motifs and themes from Genshin, or else it would just feel like it was put there for the sake of shock value. So, let's humor the question. What would the corruption of the Vigilant Yaksha do narratively for Genshin? First, it would cement the horrifying irony of Aether and Lumine. In his Serenity potlines, Zhao has made it clear that the Traveler was somehow alleviating the pain he was carrying, though through means he himself is not quite sure of. To have their sibling be the one to not only return, but also amplify the pain of the Guardian Yaksha would bear a morbid contrast of power, falling into the usual motif of light and dark. But the Traveler wouldn't be the only one affected. The corruption of close ally would bring forth urgency and raise the stakes for every other action taken in the story. The key characters in this case would be the Geo and Animal Archon. Venti and Zhongli's tales revolve around resting, that after centuries of hard work, it is finally time for them to sit back and let mortal life flourish. However, Zhao's corruption would put a test to that desire, and they would be forced to either retaliate or become passive after the fall of a comrade, Venti especially since Devalin was only recently cured. His corruption would also force the Archons into a secondary tribulation. How involved would either have to be with the same fallen civilization that they destroyed 500 years ago? Would they hold back, or would seeds of doubt and guilt plant in both the Archons? 
Would they blame Zhao's demise as a form of karma for their sins in the past? Or would they simply see this as another atrocity against the gods that must be punished? Who knows? But neither of the Archon's grief could compare to the last impact of Zhao's corruption. Zhao's corruption would finally give the Guardian Yaksha the salvation he desires. The final peace after eons of suffering. Pervasis has said this best about death. It is the easy way out. A selfish indulgence, even. This final moment of the conqueror of demons would be somber, and perhaps even relieving. Zhao would finally fall into a dreamless sleep. After all the nightmares that haunted him. The corruption of the Vigilant Yaksha is not fate set in stone. But while it is merely an imaginative exercise, we have to understand that the mere possibility of it is entertaining to reflect upon. The Corruption Trilogy is simply a narrative experiment that explored four potential characters in the grand scheme of Genshin's plot. And whether or not these videos are fulfilled, it has done its job to open the possibilities. Regardless, I am quite excited for what is to come for the story of Genshin, and how Celestia and Conria will play into existing character stories. But regardless, thank you so much for watching. This is Aster, and I hope to see you all next time.